event. Good morning, good afternoon to all the participants. Thank you for participating in our webinar, what are the achievements of climate-related shareholder proposals in Japan and what's next? I'm Matsuki from Proxy Watcher. This webinar is co-hosted by Proxy Watcher in Tokyo and Insightia in London. First of all, I'd like to give you some housekeeping announcements. We provide simultaneous interpretation of Japanese and English. Please select the language from the globe icon at the bottom of the screen. If you have any problem during the webinar, please send me a chat message. In the later half of this event, we are going to hold a Q&A session. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Please indicate to whom you're asking your question. You can post your questions during the session as well. After the seminar, we will inform you about the questionnaire. If you respond to the questionnaire, we will send you the materials used in this webinar that we are allowed to provide. Thank you for your cooperation in advance. Some of the slides are provided in either language, either in Japanese or English. Some other slides are provided in both languages. We will send some slides to respondents of the survey in both languages to the extent possible. Let me now introduce our panelists. First, we have the attorney at law, Mr. Sakon Kuramoto, who is active in ESG fields such as business and human rights. From institutional investor Robeco, we have Mr. Nick Spooner and Mr. Haonan Wu of Federated Hermes. And we have the environmental NGOs speaker, uh, Ms. Eri Watanabe, Yasuko Suzuki, and also Megu Fukazawa. As you can see on the screen, we will have presentations by each speaker. We have six panelists. We plan to spend one hour for the presentations, which will be followed by 30 minute Q&A session. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the very first speaker, Mr. Kuramoto, attorney at law. He is going to talk about the roles and issues of ESG shareholders from the perspective of dialogue or engagement with shareholders. Hello, I'm Sakon Kuramoto, Tony at Law. Today, I want to talk about the ESG shareholders' challenges from the perspective of shareholders. So I'll be the very first speaker. If you could move on to my next slide. I'd like to introduce myself just briefly on this slide. I'm certified attorney as in Japan as well as in the state of New York. And we're providing support to Japanese companies and overseas companies. ESGs, human rights and business, climate change are some of the areas where I practice my law and I am also providing support to NGOs. Recently, there has been stakeholders activities. So I'd like to talk about the roles of ESG shareholders from the perspective of the shareholders. I have about five minutes for my presentation today, so I'd like to just give you the gist and key points so that I can lay the ground for the further discussion today. So largely speaking, I want to talk about the trend of stakeholder capitalism. Stakeholder capitalism can be defined in many different ways, but basically, it is the capitalism where companies pursue not only the maximization of short-term profits, but pursue the creation of longer-term values, values of wide range of stakeholders and society as a whole. So that will be the definition that I would like to give to the stakeholder capitalism. So if you look at this major trend, 
this is a trend that is irreversible. And we see the expansion of ESG investment and loans. Institutional investors and financial organizations are making investments in the areas of ESGs, and this is a major trend in Japan as well. Japanese companies who are the recipient of the investment, including unlisted, non-listed companies, they need to understand this trend for ensuring mid to long-term growth of their business. So when it comes to stakeholder capitalism, this really indicates the need for companies to have sincere engagement with shareholders. There have been disciplines being introduced in Japan. We have the revised corporate governance code. This is designed for listed companies. This is in the form of rules for listing their shares. And as you can see, there are several basic principles. The principle number one says listed companies have a diverse range of stakeholders, including shareholders. Without appropriate collaboration with these stakeholders, it will be difficult to achieve sustainable growth. It indicates that shareholders is the key, and that is really the primary anchor in the discipline of corporate governance. Basic principle two reads that listed companies have many stakeholders in addition to shareholders. So these stakeholders include employees, internal parties, and externally they have customers, suppliers, and other external parties and local communities. And this indicates the need to have collaboration with these all kinds of stakeholders. Now, in addition to these, corporate governance codes also says that the basic principle one does one says to ensure shareholders' right, listed companies should take appropriate measures to ensure that shareholders' rights, including the right to vote at shareholders' meetings. Principle one does two says that recognizing that general meeting of shareholders is a forum for constructive, di constructive dialogue with shareholders. This company should create an appropriate environment for exercising their rights. Principle 2-2 reads, listed companies should set forth their corporate values with respect to appropriate collaboration with stakeholders, respect for their interest and in sound business ethics and establish and practice rules of conduct for their members to be able to follow. In addition to that, to the Corporate Governance Code, Financial Services Agency, FSA, sets forth the guidelines for investor company dialogue. And this dialogue indicate that general meeting of shareholders is really the forum for constructive dialogue with shareholders. Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry set forth value co-creation guidance 2.0. This says the practical engagement is critical for companies and investors so that they can co-create uh, meet to long-term values of the companies. So companies and shareholders, in other words, investors, need to collaborate to co-create long-term sustainable corporate values. So as you can see, the Corporate Governance Code and the Value Co-Creation Guidance indicate that the investors, shareholders who claim to enhance values in ESG areas, what are they going to do going forward? So I'd like to give you my perspective. In recent years, there has been shareholder advocacy groups, asset managers, and also NGOs. They have become shareholders of listed companies. They are focusing on non-financial aspects, such as ESNG, 
and they have raised issues. So that really indicate the heightened ESG activism. And this is quite visible in Japan for the past one and two years. NGOs are taking actions. ESG shareholders are very active at shareholders meetings. And last year and the year before, we have seen the shareholders who had a focus on climate change really approached companies. And as you can see, the participants today from environmental NGOs, they are very active in making proposals to real estate companies. So again, my own perspective is that going forward, real estate companies and shareholders will have to have engagement a dialogue. And I think the shareholder uh, proposals is a part of this engagement that is much needed. It's been sensationally reported by mass media, but I would believe that's part of the engagement. Considering the large trend that we see today, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, listed companies will have to have constructive engagement with shareholders, stakeholders, in a wider sense. So, listed companies and shareholders have to have better uh, engagement, and shareholder proposal is one way to achieve this engagement. So going forward, it's not just limited companies, listed companies, but shareholders who are making proposals, both will have to be accountable. When they approach management of the listed companies, they are asked to persuade the management so they have to make the persuasive proposals. And shareholders, when they make proposals to listed companies, as I mentioned earlier, it is just one aspect of their engagement with the listed companies. Through such process, shareholders and institutional uh, investors need to be persuasive. They have to persuade the management of the targeted company to change their actions in a positive direction. There is a company, though, in Japan from that framework. A resolution can be presented by shareholders. in the form of advisory resolutions in many different ways. Shareholders, including institutional investors, can actually provide instructions and persuade the management group as they guide into making advisory resolution. And they can also present their intention as to how to elect the directors, the members of the board of directors. Of course, advisory resolutions can be voted, and also for the proposal for election of the directors. Compared to uh, the proposal to amend the Articles of Incorporation, I believe there is much higher probability of succeeding utilizing advisory resolution or election of directors. Uh, and roles of institutional investors are actually increasing, becoming more important. And companies are willing to listen to institutional investors' opinions. And I think it is also important for shareholders to work together mutually. So what I'd like to emphasize here is the 
ESG shareholders' role is quite important for Japanese companies to be able to continue to grow in mid and long term space. They will have to have appropriate dialogue and ESG shareholders as well, and not simply external stakeholders. They are important uh, shareholders. So they should involve other shareholders so that they can be even more persuasive when they approach the management of uh, companies. So it's not just a proposal, a shareholder proposal. But they have to have a long-term engagement approach when they make proposals. <coughs> so uh, that's it from myself. Thank you very much. Kurumoto uh, said, thank you very much. So that was very clear. I think it was a perfect content as an opening presentation. Now, Nick, from the institutional investor's point of view, um, I understand you don't have slides, so I'll just pin you. Being here and, and what a great introduction and that really leads into many of the things I intend to uh, speak upon as well. Um, so my name is Nick Spooner. I'm from Rubico. We're an institutional investor. We have both active and passive ESG strategies. I think it's also worth mentioning that we do have a climate strategy as well to reach net zero emissions across our funds by 2050 and reduce the emissions within our portfolios by 50% by 2030 and 30% by 2025. What we do around our engagement activity, uh, including around shareholder proposals, is with that sort of vision in mind. It is with the long-term goal of reaching net zero emissions by 2050 and with the ambition of reducing uh, risks associated with our portfolios and having a real world impact in terms of reducing emissions. So we see shareholder proposals as one of the options that we have as investors to improve the climate performance of companies. Uh, we have a number of other options to sort of escalate our engagement with companies. We do see shareholder proposals as a constructive part of our engagement. We tend to file these resolutions after having worked with companies for multiple years before we get to the point of filing a shareholder resolution. In some cases, this can be seen as adversarial, but in some cases it can be seen as constructive. And in many regions around the world, we're seeing the trend where companies are also supporting resolutions that have been filed by shareholders. And in those cases, we tend to see support for those resolutions above the 95% level. Increasingly, we see, we're seeing a trend around say on climate votes where we're seeing this increased hybridization between shareholder proposals and management proposals on climate related matters. Uh, this isn't a trend that I've seen come to Japan yet, but we could see it come over time. Um, and this is where sort of we're creating a sort of decision point around where shareholders opine on the climate strategy of a company. Um, and we're seeing those put forward both by management and by shareholders. Um, in general, the process of filing shareholder resolutions, and I've been involved in these a number of these over the years, is quite arduous in terms of collaborating, as the last speaker said, and getting to the right levels of uh, shareholder sort of yeah shareholder um, rights that we have in terms of filing those resolutions. And so we tend to only file a few resolutions per year as an organisation, though work with many other organisations on filing other resolutions as well. Um, however, there are some cases where we do see some shareholders filing multiple different re multiple resolutions across different companies. This tends to be a more systematic approach to filing shareholder proposals. We've seen this in the case of lobbying and we're seeing it increasingly in the US uh, around accounting as well, sort of go over the past two years as well, climate related accounting that is. 
Um, this idea of consistent wording is a really important one when it comes to filing shareholder proposals. Uh, in general, what we tend to see is wording will learn and develop from each other over time. Um, and so what we see is almost like a precedent setting when it comes to shareholder proposals so that other uh, investors who are looking to file proposals can learn from the successes and failures of resolutions in the past. Um, we've seen this, I think a good example is around the discussion around capital expenditure um, and the resolution that was filed at BP in, in 2019, I think, uh, around capital expenditure in the oil and gas sector has really gone on to be used in many different resolutions around the world uh, following that. This stems from the difficulty uh, with oil and gas companies, and I know that some of the other panelists will go into this in more detail around some of these companies sc setting scope three targets and what that means to set scope three targets on both uh, um, intensity and an absolute level. Um, but what we're really trying to do here is sort of build precedent such that when a shareholder proposal is supported that sort of we're setting precedent for many of those big asset managers to come support that in many other cases. And in general, we tend to see an increase in support for climate related shareholder proposals over time. In terms of how we evaluate the shareholder proposals from an investor perspective, I'm a sort of thematic specialist being a climate change engagement specialist within our active ownership team. Our active ownership team sits within our broader sustainability investing center at Rubico, which includes the active ownership team, but also sustainability researchers, client related sustainability professionals as well, and um, some of our sort of thought leaders and strategists around climate, biodiversity and other thematics as well. The voting is done in a sort of hybridized way, but it's mostly done through specialized voting professionals who look at many of, diff of these different ballots across sort of thousands of companies per year. It's an incredibly impressive job that they do. On climate related shareholder resolutions, they do consult with us as uh, thematic experts around these issues. And we also consult the relevant investment teams where necessary. In general, our approach to voting on shareholder proposals takes a principles based approach, which means Despite the engagement that we've done with companies, we tend to look at the merits of the object uh, of the shareholder proposal and whether that is leading to sort of positive outcomes with that company in particular. Um, one important consideration we do make in terms of sort of our differing view on these shareholder proposals is the legal implications. For example, in the US, uh, where the shareholder proposals are advisory, we might take a different approach to how we view resolutions compared to the UK and Japan, where the, the resolutions tend to be legally binding. Um, in terms of how we look at the resolutions themselves, we see this, uh, as was said by the previous panelists, as a way of focusing attention around a particular issue and stimulating dialogue between investors and corporates around a certain issue. And we see that as a really constructive part of our engagement. Nevertheless, we do see sort of the scope for engagement throughout the year, not stimulated by engagement is really important in our process as well. In terms of resolutions and what we look for, clearly we're looking for something that will have a positive impact in terms of improving the company's climate strategy and reducing the risks that the company is associated with. Things that do put us off in terms of supporting these shareholder proposals, which we tend to support most of them, uh, from a statistical perspective is when shareholder proposals can be overly prescriptive in terms of overly dictating what a company should do and therefore narrowing the strategic options that a company might have. So we prefer, prefer to come for resolutions to allow for companies to have some interpretation or flexibility in terms of the interpretation of those resolutions in terms of how they execute their strategy. So we're looking for that sort of perfect balance between sophistication, clarity, and not being overly prescriptive in terms of the shareholder proposals. If we don't see a company progressing through a shareholder, shareholder proposal, uh, we do consider voting against directors, uh, especially if we've seen high levels of support for that shareholder proposal and inadequate action from those companies. 
that really leads me on to my final point around sort of other actions as well. And I know the focus of this uh, webinar is really around shareholder proposals. But another part of my role is in terms of reaching net zero, in terms of reducing our emissions as an organization, um, we are measuring the alignment of companies to the goals of the Paris Agreement. We have a sort of proprietary framework for how we do that, but we're really looking at companies' targets. And beyond what we're doing around shareholder proposals, because of the limits that we have in terms of filing shareholder proposals and the constraints in terms of number of proposals that are filed per year, we do vote against a number of directors per year when we think companies have inadequate climate strategies or uh, breaching norms in terms of their approach to climate risk management as well. And we see that as a really important part of how we engage with the companies, but also how we sort of shift them over time in a more systematic way um, across our portfolios. And we see that as sort of us meeting our fiduciary duty uh, in terms of reducing emissions and managing Thank you, Nick. So institutional investors, how they deal with this uh, shareholder proposals. So now I'd like to go to Mr. Hao Nao Wu. He is going to talk about how can companies increase shareholders' values from the investors and climate groups. Would you be able to talk about how shareholder proposals have helped companies? Sure, sure, that'd be great. Do you have a slide available as well? Yes, please let me bring the slide back. There you go. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my name is Hanu Wu and uh, I would like to talk about how companies can increase shareholder values from uh, dialogues with investors and the climate change groups. And uh, on the next slide, uh, we wanted to look into a, the rationale for climate change dialogues, why is it important to have the dialogue and what, what would be the resulting impact. Uh, in, the text, in the context of uh, uh, rationale for uh, climate change dialogue, uh, there's increased uh, consideration of climate change from the financial institutions and climate change continues to be the most concerned and the material issues for the uh, long-term investor, uh, long-term institutional investors, and uh, with increased commitment from uh, institutional investors and asset management asset managers to meet the net zero commitments and the 1.5 degrees and the G funds net zero asset owner alliance and the net zero asset owner asset manager initiative as well. Um, in the next slide, um, yeah. Um, so on, as we experience the cli uh, climate change, uh, there's expectation to address the impact of physical and the transition risks. And um, with the physical risks from climate change, uh, there's a news to address that the global warming of at least 1.5 degrees versus uh, pre-industrial temperature is now almost inevitable. And also the economic cost of high warming will be severe and the social impact will be uh, far higher as well. And there's a uh, regional differentiations and large uncertainties and possible tipping points mark a uh, uh, risk assessment challenging, although the scenario analysis is an increasing powerful tool. Um, in 2022, um, Europe dropped exacerbated energy crisis, uh, limiting generations from nuclear and hydropower plants and in Japan experiencing worst heat waves since the record began in 1875. Uh, equal to uh, transition risks, uh, policy uh, evolution and the technology development from uh, support on the climate actions will uh, transform global and the national um, economies uh, as the energy uh, economy system uh, decarbonize and also the tr uh, delayed transition uh, with increased physical impacts will likely cause the more disruptive transitions, both economically and socially. And early and effective policy action and the technological support is essential going forward. With the recent studies suggest that the mainstream scenario have underestimated the disruptive potential of the emerging low carbon technologies and from the policy side as well we can see that in 2022 the u.s inflation reduction act has come into place and in japan there's a green trend uh, green transformation program that's in place as well so there's a need for our companies investors and society as a whole to address the physical risk and the trans transition risk going forward uh, on the next slide um so why is it important to have the dialogue? And um, in the next slide, so 
does future expectation for companies uh, from investors and the climate groups um, expecting for the targeting, uh, targeting the climate actions, uh, involving strategy and the delivery as well. So the continuing um, climate dialogue allows company to gain the perspective from the stakeholders and there is urgency from the international community to tackle the impact of climate change and meet the 1.5 degree scenario. Uh, focusing on the climate laggards and that they are under pressure to pick up a place and the stakeholders are pushing for stronger positions and tangible outcomes on the climate change mitigation going forward. Um, some of the expectations that we have for the company is that um, uh, we expect them to achieve a 1.5 degree scenario that is science-based and then it's zero by 2050 or sooner with a disclosure on the detailed expectation of sale or transfer of carbon intensive assets as they move towards uh, decarbonization pathways and increased transparency on uh, physical uh, climate risks, resilience and adaptation of a just transition as well. On next slide. So if you look into the uh, uh, climate change journey and pathway to 1.5, we see that there's a lot of company that has already discussed TCFDs and set up uh, net zero goals uh, 2050 or sooner. But at this point going forward, we expect the companies to uh, develop aligned strategy, uh, preferably obtaining SBTI or disclosure on the 1.5 aligned strategy that's similar to that aspect that's convincing. And that there's a expectation that we want to see a allied delivery with the CAPEX plan or actual reduction of uh, green gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, in line with 1.5 uh, aligned strategy as well. So on the next slides, um, with engaging with the company, uh, having an in-depth dialogues and a communication on the climate change with the company is vital and the primary objective is to support the company on this climate change transition as there is an increase in pressure to demonstrate how company is going to meet the climate change target that is aligned to the asset management strategies and institutional expectations and to mitigate the wider societal impact as well. Um, I just want to stress that this is something that we want to work together with the companies and the support uh, going forward. And it is important to have the dialogue uh, with the companies to achieve that going, uh, going forward in the discussions. And one of the key points is that uh, it is important to uh, engage with the board and assess how the board can and should be held accountable for the climate discussions. And through that, we understand that there are some disagreements on climate change, who should be held accountable, responsibility, and which benchmark and metric to be used. But however, engaging and having a dialogue with the companies allows us to influence and to challenge the company on its strategy and assumptions, and that might not be aligned with the scientific community as well, that we can provide them with the perspective of the international uh, communities and other regions, other sectors, and we encourage them to move forward with the uh, climate change um, mitigation um, commitments going forward. Um, and for uh, financial um, industries, um, it is also important that they must do all they can to analyze and measure and manage the green gas as footprint of the portfolio, including uh, financing, lending, and underwriting activities as well. Thank you. So what was the resulting impact uh, that's coming from the discussions and, and the engagement with the companies and you know, involving the dialogues on the climate change issues? Uh, next slide. So here's some examples that uh, we have been engaging um, and having a dialogue uh, with the companies in Japan, uh, mainly on the uh, mega banks in Japan, and one of them is Mizuho, which is uh, one of the first companies to receive the climate change, climate change related shareholder proposal in uh, 2019, initiated by NGOs. Um, they're also part of the uh, institutional investor groups on climate change, II. CCC uh, engagement program where we uh, collaboratively engage with other investors uh, uh, to the companies on the climate change issues. And uh, engagement focusing on the fossil fuel financing, disclosure on the greenhouse gas emissions and the reduction target uh, set in line with 1.5 degrees. And throughout the years, um, be, we see a, a positive impact from the companies. Um, this year, the company has launched a framework to assess the credibility of its clients uh, uh, climate transition plan, <clears throat> and also it is uh, one of the first uh, Japanese uh, financial institution to join the PCAF, which is a partnership for carbon accounting and financials as well. 
Um, however, there's also a further expectations for uh, financial institutions to tighten the financing and actual implementation and disclosure of the financing activities and also uh, restricting some of the fossil fuel financing that they are um, uh, currently going forward. Um, with a similar um, discussion as well with the MEFG and SMBC, they, they are also a part of IACC's engagement programs and they also both received the shareholder proposals. And through that, we also see that uh, there's a commitment from the companies to uh, stop booking new coal fin uh, project financing uh, going forward with the improved uh, disclosure and the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets as well. But also in line with the Mizuho, we expect uh, a better uh, tightening of the financing activities surrounding the fossil fuels and better disclosures um, uh, going forward on their activities. Uh, moving on to the next slides. We also see um, uh, not only just on the financial uh, sectors, but we also see a utility sectors where they have received the shareholder proposals and the continued engagement as part of the um, IITCC utility engagement program, which is the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change. And it was the one of the first companies to receive the shareholder proposal from institutional investors on the climate change and the outcome resulted into improvement of greenhouse house, uh, GHG emission reduction targets. Um, and we also want to see um, a disclosure and transparency on decarbonization strategy involving hydrogen and ammonia and the possibility of them to obtain a, a science-based target for 1.5 degrees to align their strategies uh, in, in, a, in a based on science manner. And as a previous panelist mentioned that as well, that uh, uh, I just wanted to give examples of outside of Japan uh, on the BP cases, um, case where the climate it is part of the uh, Climate Action 100 Plus Collaborative Engagement Program, and uh, they received the shareholder proposal in 2019 with the support from institutional investors. And the shareholder proposal received the support from the management with more than 90% of support on the resolution, resulting in a company to disclose emission reduction target as well. Um, so this is something that we wanted to um, emphasize that the shareholder uh, proposal doesn't have to be uh, um, Kind of hostile manner. That's something that we could work with uh, with the companies to to come up with something that that, that, that we can have a, a large support um, to to support the companies on their uh, climate change um, um, mitigation strategies. Um, however, that we do still see an expectation for the companies going forward as well, uh, setting a robust uh, offsetting strategy and divestment policy going forward. And also uh, consider um, the physical risk, which is coming in more uh, clearly uh, as we uh, move towards the 2030. So on the next slides. So I also wanted to talk about the, what's the evidence, uh, some of the evidence that indicated the, the impact of uh, uh, shareholder values um, by discussing uh, climate change issues with the companies and some of the evidence indicate that there's a relationship between the climate change and the uh, shareholder engagement and that leads to downside risks and the climate change um, investor engagement appears to reduce the systematic risk marginally, marginally at the global level um, produced by the uh, Professor Hoffner from the University College Dublin and also we look into the environmental performance uh, hedge fund and the pension fund uh, activism reduced the amount of toxic emission uh, of target firms and also there's a carbon risk premium which indicated that the investors uh, look into the um, climate change um, commitments made by the companies and there's a pricing for that uh, at this time as well. So these both um, indicated that the benefits of uh, dialogue between in, uh, investors and the climate change group with the company and addressing the issue of the climate change is beneficial for the company. I just have to rush you through a little bit, but uh, yeah, that'll be my presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haonan. That's you so much, informative. Thank you very much, Haonan-san. えっと、それではこれまでえっと、不関投資家の2人からえっと、株主提案ないし質問えっと、ESG に関する まずえっと、マーケットフォースのえっと、福澤さんにえっと、バトンを渡したいなと思います。福澤さん、どうぞよろしくお願いします。よろしくお願いします。え、福澤マーケットフォースです。Thank you everyone for attending. 
So I'm going to be talking about the shareholder proposals that were lodged with Japanese trading houses in the past couple of years, specifically Sumitomo Corporation and Mitsubishi Corporation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so first, before going into Sumitomo Corporation, I just want to give you a little bit of a background on why we had these shareholder resolutions on Japanese trading houses. Um, Japanese trading houses are involved in expanding the fossil fuel industry um, and, and also because they're expanding the fossil fuel industry, but they tend to have net zero to 2050 targets, so it's difficult to see the consistency between these two things. Um, and Japanese trading houses are very important to Japanese society and economy, and we'd really like to see them as leaders and de in decarbonization in Japan. So in terms of Sumitomo Corporation, um, we started, NGOs started engaging with Sumitomo Corporation, um, especially around 2019. Um, and despite being committed to being carbon neutral by 2050, they had many plans to expand the coal power sector and coal policies with major loopholes. Uh, next slide, please. So our engagement starting from 2019, but much more in 2020 centered around their coal policies. For example, we were really concerned with their coal power generation policy, which allowed them to be involved with continuing to build new coal power projects anywhere in the world um, because they were saying it, was, it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, their coal exposure because of this, um, as well as engagement on improved disclosure, metrics and target setting, so that investors would understand the pathway that Sumitomo had to carbon neutral to neutrality, which they were committed to. Next slide, please. So uh, this proposal was lodged in March, 2021. While we still continue to engage with the company on the proposal, as well as all of the items that I just mentioned in the previous slide, um, and it was really a forum for us, as well as a forum for investors to engage with the company on these issues. Uh, next slide, please. So after engagement with the company and also investor engagement with the company, even before the shareholder vote um, during the June AGM season, we saw some changes in Sumitomo's policy leading up to the AGM. So we see for coal mining, for example, they have a two, they had a 2019 policy, which limited the equity share of coal production to current levels. Um, and in May 2021, before the actual AGM, we saw a revised policy where they ended further investment in coal mining um, and to achieve uh, net achieve zero production and coal mining by 2030. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and in terms of the coal fire generation policy changes after engagement leading up to the shareholder proposal, again, the in the 2019 policy, um, we saw that there's this loophole that I talked about that allowed them to build coal power plants on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and then through engagement and including the shareholder resolution, we saw that in the revised policy, they had that there's there'd be no new developments as an independent power producer or also as an engineering procurement and construction contractor, EPC contractor. Um, but they left one loophole open, was, which was to be able to be possibly involved with Matarai 2, um, which, is a, which was a coal power plant in Bangladesh that was very controversial for both environmental and human rights reasons. Uh, next slide, please. So we see after the um, after the shareholder proposal, um, which was in 2021, um, a little bit less than a year after that shareholder proposal, we saw a further update to their policy, where for the coal-fired generation policy, um, they, ex they took away the loophole for Matabari. Um, so there was a straightforward no loophole coal policy that said they would not be involved in, in new developments as an IPP or EPC. Um, and there's some uh, CO2 reduction targets made, um, as well as some of the updates, but we're still planning to engage with Sumitomo on this on continued reduction. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, yeah, thank you. 
So with Mitsubishi Corporation, um, this is the biggest trading house by assets in Japan and it's very important to Japan's economy. Um, and they do also have a net zero by 2050 commitment, but they plan to expand the fossil gas or liquefied natural gas business. Um, and they lack a policy on new oil and gas and new LNG projects. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of our engagement with Mitsubishi leading up to the shareholder resu resolution, um, it was, as I mentioned, about engagement on their pol policies, um, engagement on a need for assessment of new oil and gas and LNG projects against a 1.5 degree scenario, as well as just improved disclosure to make sure that Mitsubishi is adequately considering and managing financial risks that climate change poses to its business. Thank you, Kofang. Um, and the shareholder resolution, um, as you can see, uh, there's two, there was two shareholder resolution lodged um, in 2022 um, as part, and we talked to the company about these as well. Um, and they follow our engagement quite closely. One is on emission reduction targets and the other one related to disclosure in relation to net zero by 2050. Um, and, and quite similar to the, the 2019 BP resolution that, that Nick was mentioning. Next slide, please. Um, so since engagement, engagement on the shareholder resolution, as well as on these issues that I mentioned before, um, there have been some, some changes and we continue our engagement with Mitsubishi. So we see in October, 2021, that in their roadmap to carbon neutral society, um, LNG is just mentioned as a supply during the transition period and we see during our engagement and leading up to the to the AGM in 2022 in June, that LNG became designated as a transform subject to additional scrutiny and consideration. Um, and this had to do with it being part of the company's category 11 emissions use of sold products, which is the majority of Mitsubishi's scope three emissions. Um, and Mitsubishi is considering further disclosure so investor engagement is really critical. Um, and we, we really urge investors to keep engaging with the trading houses and, and, and push them for more disclosure and be leaders in decarbonization in Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Now we would like to go to banking industry. We have Eri Watanabe from 350.org Japan. Hello, I'm Watanabe from 350 Japan. I'd like to talk about the Megabank's climate policy updates, how it's been promoted by shareholders' proposals, and what could be some future challenges. 350 Japan, since 2016, has started engagement with three megabanks in Japan. Two years ago, Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group, we actually made the uh, shareholder proposal to MUFG together with other NGOs. For the past three years, shareholders' proposals were submitted to three megabanks. Basically, this is about asking companies to come up with business strategy in line with the Paris Agreement. And last year, we also added a new resolution for the, uh, the financing investment uh, strategy in line with the Paris Agreement. And as you can see, the climate actions have been promoted in a positive way. As of 2018, there was no meaningful policy and climate change by mega banks, but a new policy has been introduced, although there were many exceptions uh, in 2019. In 2020, Kiko Network made a shareholder's proposal to Mitsuho Financial Group. For the very first time, they set the zero credit balance target for coal power project. And transition risk scenario analysis was disclosed at the same time. In 2021, shareholder proposal was submitted to MUFG for the very first time in Japan. Net zero emission reduction target was set forth by 
uh, financial institution by MUFG. And in the same year, uh, former Prime Minister Suga uh, pledged carbon neutrality in 2050. But the MUFG actually set forth this zero emission a target even before the government. And last year, a shareholder's proposal was set, sent to SNBC. As a result, new finance policy was set forth to uh, ban the support to new or expansion of coal-fired infrastructure project. Some of these enhanced policies spread throughout mega banks, and we do see additional ripple effect on other industries as well. According to the third party report, shareholders resolution or engagement have proven to be effective. Going to the next slide, I'd like to also examine the impact of shareholders proposal. There has been continued effect we do see the enhancement of their policies in the years where proposals were not sent. Up until 2019, policies were made once a year, but since then, not at the timing of spring, on multiple occasions, their climate-related policies have been improved. I believe that what has been engaged has been accepted deeply by these companies. The slides indicate some of the examples of policy enhancement and a better information uh, disclosure. Coal power restrictions on expansion of existing coal power project uh, is a good example. On the other hand, as Ms. Fukazawa, Fukuzawa mentioned, net zero target, uh, toward this target, there are multiple challenges. For example, in 2030, emission reduction targets from investment and loan portfolio, Nick also mentioned this intensity target has been set. So CO2 emission per kilowatt hour so they can still achieve the target even though the absolute amount of emission increases. High-level expert group last year indicated that they should focus on the reduction of absolute amount of emission rather than intensity targets. If you look at the oil gas sector, they are focusing on upstream infrastructures. Pipelines, LMG terminals were excluded. And sectoral targets are also not targeting the uh, investment underwriting. It's only on loan amounts. And we have seen enhanced due diligence on However, there has not been a uh, practical restrictions. Because of the time constraints, there are some exceptions left in coal mining policies. As a result, we do see the continued financing to coal sector. This graph is based on the report issued yesterday, NITS Zero Banking Alliance member banks since the timing of their joining up to August last year, how much they are providing in finances to the top coal expanders. Three mega month of surveyed 56 banks made up to the top seven banks in terms of their investment investment to top coal expanders. So my um, conclusion 
NGO shareholders' proposals engagement helped mega banks enhance their climate policies and disclosures. However, loopholes remain in the strengthened policies and targets and investment and loan continue, which are inconsistent with net zero pathway. To achieve net zero, it is essential to develop and strengthen short term and medium term targets to ensure decarbonization and policies to limit investment and loans to com to companies with new fossil fuel businesses or expansion plans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Watanabe-san. Lastly, we'd like to ask Ms. Suzuki Yasuko from the Climate Network to talk about uh, the 2022 uh, proxy voting results with regard to the shareholder proposals we made in relation to the climate changes. I am Suzuki from the Climate Network, KIK Network. I'd like to talk about 2022 uh, shareholders' proxy voting results. So I'm sure that uh, those who are participating today know about the results of the proxy results, so I'll skip this slide. Uh, so the trend we see in 2022 is that we saw a record number of shareholder proposals by two, two Japanese companies, especially related to ESGs. And as we heard from Nick earlier, for the JE Power, um, large asset management company made a, sh made a shareholder proposal, so that attracted attention, and we believe this is also having a spillover effect in Japan. Japanese companies are becoming more global, and they're active globally. Therefore, in international investors are gaining attention to the Japanese companies, so we believe this trend will continue. So what I put here is that when what are the barriers to shareholder proposals in Japan? As we heard earlier, um, so basically the shareholder proposals have to take the form of changing the articles of incorporation because uh, they wanted to make an agenda for the AGM. That was the reason why for this. And uh, in the case of proposal to Mizuho, um, it was objected by other shareholders because it had to change the articles of incorporation. But in the past few years, uh, of course, uh, still it requires a change of the articles of incorporation, but uh, there is a more tendency to focus on the content of the shareholder proposal. So there's a mixed uh, views with regard to this proposal. So the biggest concerns about the shareholder proposals is that it might limit the enterprise activities, but they would also look at the long-term, mid-term view and whether this will have a long-term benefit on the company's value. And there are some trends to review, revisit those kind of um, perspectives. So what's positive recently is that uh, because of the revision of the stewardship code, um, this pushed to closure, disclosure of voting results and reasons for um, or against of integer proposals. So institutional investors, why they pro opposed or uh, supported, uh, the reasons will be disclosed and uh, they, are able they will be able to enhance their engagement. The reasons why they, they opposed so far is because th this proposal took the form of changing the articles of incorporation. And one of the trends that we saw in 2022 is that the companies are already showing some kind of plans or strategies with regard to the climate changes, so they just should just proceed with those plans. That was another reason. And also, uh, they are already con conducting some risk assessment, assessment related to the climate change, so it's not going to affect their profitability. And another reason for the opposition is that uh, it should not be explicitly articulated in the articles of incorporation. So what I put here is the against and for, some of the reasons for against and for those shareholder proposals. Uh, one of the 
reasons against is that they consider it's not going to improve the enterprise value. And there are also reasons for which says it's going to improve the enterprise value, which shows that uh, our approach is getting better understanding on the part of the investors and also their views on climate change related risk is changing. So when we we conducted a survey of proxy voting reports, you can see it's a mixed picture in terms of pros and cons. And uh, there are some cases where they um, abstained from making votes because uh, there was a both support and against within the same institution. And this shows the proxy voting results of domestic investment trustee. Uh, maybe there are um, companies participating today who are listed here. And thank you for your participation. So there are for and against. Uh, the text is very small, but the ones that are colored are four. So there are asset management companies that are showing um, support for many of them and those who are not. And we, we cannot compare Apple to Apple because it, we don't have all the data from the past three years, but uh, we can see that there's a trend uh, for increasing number of support for those shareholder proposals. And this one is the international investment trustee. Uh, the previous one is the domestic. And you can see that we have more colored uh, green ones, which is support doing the proposals. And I think this shows the difference between domestic and international investment trustees. The reason for this is that in terms of the enterprise value, um, in, in, international investors have the better understanding that this proposal is going to benefit the enterprise value and also their views on the disclosure of information is quite different than the domestic players. And they also look to TCFD in making decisions and also the institutional investor investment companies. Uh, specify climate risk related disclosure requirements in their voting guidelines and policies. So the, if you we read their uh, guideline, they include wording as, uh, it doesn't necessarily say it. it should be aligned with the Paris goals, but they will, also, they specify that they will look at the mid to long term company strategies. And another point that these investment trustees look at is the uh, the decision made by the proxy advisors. This is the uh, the support and against from the Glass Lewis and IS in 2022. With regard to the proposals made in 2022, ISS uh, showed more support. And the com there are com in investors who look at this result and make their own decisions. And there are also investors who look, look to their own guidelines in making decisions. But uh, we can see that um, it's a quite a mixed picture and it's quite divided because the views and perspectives on climate change is changing and evolving. And I think there is a global trend that we need to also consider but we expect something to change in the positive manner. And what we expect for 2023, I mentioned that the major two players, um, they added new item, which was not included in 2022. Uh, so if the disclosure, information disclosure on climate change is not enough, they um, recommend voting against the proposal to elect responsible directors. So climate change related data, uh, to extent they will be disclosed. Well, each company, um, many companies do disclose TCFD related reports. And as we heard earlier, there are some 
improvements and we see more disclosures these days. However, how this is going to evolve going forward, it's important to also set some kind of qualitative targets. And especially if you look at ISS, they said that if they do not have any quantitative, um, this quantifiable reduction targets, uh, I think this is a very positive big trend and companies uh, would uh, hopefully uh, make their qualitative or uh, quantifiable reduction targets based on this guideline. That is all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Suzuki. Now we would like to begin the Q&A session. We have about 30 minutes. I'd like to continue on up to 7.28. I'd like to stop sharing the slides. So some of the questions that we received, advisory proposal. So I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Kuramoto. Uh, there are many questions that are posed to him. So in the order of the presentations, uh, this is from Tahara-san, advisory proposal. If the management accept it's possible to support this proposal. When this is presented, other investors can actually support that resolution. In order to make that happen, what actions are needed going forward? I'd like to ask Mr. Kuramoto to try to answer this question. Exactly, I have the same concern on this point. As I mentioned, advisory proposal well, in terms of the company's law, there is no legal responsibility or obligation on the part of management to take this up. And this is a concern of ESG shareholders, and that is why they resort to the proposal to amend the Articles of Incorporation. As has already been mentioned by one of the speakers, the institutional investors are today more flexible, and some are providing support to a proposal like this. But among institutional investors, the change in the article of incorporation is too decisive, especially Japanese institutional investors are conservative, not believing in that. So they are looking for other breakthroughs. ESG shareholders will have to explore other ways. Having said that, it's, uh, it's challenging. What I mean by this is that ESG shareholders whether the management is going to accept or not, there is no certainty. So all the effort that they put in may be wasted if the management simply does not accept the proposal. Or should we take this approach of proposing advisory resolutions? It's a very difficult question. So I cannot give you a clear answer. Having said that, if I were an advisor to SG shareholders, I would look at the major trend. There has been governance code and stewardship code as well, and there has been FSA, METI providing guidances, so listed companies in Japan, at least the management team of these companies are trying to enhance their mid to long term company values. If there is a climate proposal submitted if they know that they are going to increase their corporate values, 
would they say no? It will be more difficult today to say no. So ESG shareholders take this as an opportunity. The management teams of Japanese companies really have to prepare conditions where they are forced to accept the proposal. It's rather abstract, but you have to find friends. Uh, in other words, how you can involve institutional investors to become your partners, your friends, so that together you can engage with investee companies. In addition to that, you, they should try to communicate the social message more widely and more effectively. Unfortunately, the wider members of the society are not highly aware of this need. So they should try to communicate what uh, positive impact the companies can bring to general public if they are going to change in a positive way. That public education or enlightenment is going to be important. Utilizing possibly influencers who are aware of the climate change issues. And also the expert in business circles. You can ask for cooperation from these well-known figures to be able to be more effective. Sorry, I cannot give you a clear-cut answer. It's a very difficult question to answer. So that is what I have to say for now. Thank you, Mr. Kuramoto. This, uh, there has been multiple questions asked for advisory proposals. Thank you for answering uh, that question. Okay, we will move on to the next question. Uh, to the extent possible, I uh, would like to ask Watanabe-san to answer this question. I'll ping Watanabe-san. There are two questions. Okay, start with the first one. Traditionally, um, you've uh, submitted shareholder proposal to three mega banks, but I'm planning to engagement uh, expand your engagement to regional banks in the future. Thank you very much. Let's go to the engagement. As I mentioned at the outset, from 2016, we conducted uh, the engagement with three mega banks, and we're working together with the NGO. The reason we have been doing so is because the financing amount to the fossil fuel is very large with those three mega banks globally and also domestically. So I'm not saying that there is no possibility of engaging with the regional banks, but at this point, we will continue our dialogue with the three mega banks for now. And the, that is all. Is, okay. We have another question in English, and I'll read out in Japanese. This person wants to know your perspective about other industries. For example, steel industry, um, they're known to have a lot of emissions. So investment in loans into other sectors, um, trying to stop those activities to other sectors and considering sustainability issues, is it possible to approach those sectors? If you have any perspective on this, we would like to learn. Well, three mega banks is expanding their disclosure based on TCFD, and engagement policy is also s stipulated in the scenario analysis um, after the electricity gas 
they have been expanding to other industries like steel. And so I think it's possible to uh, take further actions. And in my presentation, um, I think there was a point raised, uh, and I'd like to apologize. It's about the carbon neutrality is 2020. So that I, I, I kind of thought that it's after the net zero banking, but the Mizuho's um, zero balance for the coal fire, uh, they haven't stipulated to be zero, but I think they, I think the, the Mati minister um, made an announcement. So I think they have declared to make the coal asset zero before METI. As I think I was kind of confused, so I, I got that wrong in the slide. So I'll correct the slides. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you very much. There is a comment to Ms. Watanabe as well. You might want to respond to this as well. During COP27, there has been net zero report. This has been accepted seriously by companies. So through shareholders' proposal, investors will be able to approach companies to set net zero targets. Rather than myself, other investors who are engaged in uh, companies, uh, or Nixon or Ainoi-san may be able to answer this question better. So I am trying to pick up some of the questions that I'd like to ask them. So Ms. Watanabe, thank you very much. Got questions. So uh, the prior one that the I, uh, area that I talked about, uh, there, should, uh, there have been uh, kind of the voices uh, which says that the Japanese companies need regulations uh, and shareholder proposals could play that law to have regulations to emit the, you know, the, uh, em uh, to reduce the emissions. Uh, do you think shareholder proposals have those law to set up the regulations if necessary? Maybe Haonan? Do you have any views on this? Uh, so the question is that uh, whether the shareholder has a shareholder proposal has a role to set up the regulations in Japan. Is yes. That... Yes. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, we've been talking to quite quite a few a uh, number of uh, Japanese government uh, officials as well, and um, from from my understanding that there's always a hesitancy to set up uh, some regulation that's quite. Uh, enforcing for the companies uh, we can see that from the corporate governance code as well that there's a little bit of a lack of a uh, kind of a, a kind of hard steps i suppose in terms of the uh, expectation the regulation as well um we can see that from the uh, uh new energy policy new energy um uh, strategy uh, disclosed by japan that they expect 46 percent but aiming for 50 percent as well so i do feel that there's a little bit lack of uh, commitments on their side, on the government side, in terms of regulations. But um, yeah, I, I suppose that the shareholder proposal could support on that front going forward. But yeah, from my personal perspective, it might be quite quite difficult. In that sense. Thank you. And uh, I have um, questions pick, uh, picking up from uh, Yokoyama-san uh, to uh, to Nick and Haonan. So I'll ask Nick first, and I'll come back to Haonan later. Are there any difference in attitude of corporations between Japanese uh, companies and European US Western, com US Western companies when you do the engagement? I think this means about climate. Uh, Nick, do you have any like thoughts on this? I mean, in general, there's big differences between European companies and US companies and within Europe there's big differences between how companies respond and their differences in terms of how European, US and Japanese companies respond to engagement as well. Um, 
in general, and maybe sort of tying this to the previous question around public policy, the policy debate in Europe is the most advanced we have globally. Um, and that really sort of increases the maturity that companies are able to respond to engagement requests and are able to have more sophisticated conversations with investors around their climate strategies. And so I think there is the, this uh, relationship there that is driving differences in terms of engagement as well. What that means for us as investors is we can take some of the best practices from what companies are doing um, into our engagements in the US and in Japan as well. So we find that sort of very helpful. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think the big difference is the maybe on the board access side, I would say, um, from European companies and from the US companies, uh, we, we sometimes have our access to the independent directors, uh, chair of the board um, as well. But for Japan, I think there's still a hesitancy to kind of have access uh, or give us access on the investor to, to talk to the independent directors. And I think it's uh, for climate change discussion, it's crucial for us to engage and discuss uh, these kind of topics at the board level as well. So I think I would say that's kind of uh, some uh, differences that I can see. And on, on the previous uh, question as well, that I had a bit more time to think about, yeah, I, I do believe that the investors' engagement on the policy sector is quite crucial for Japan as well to let them know that the expectation internationally and what what the company, uh, what the country needs to do to set up a target so that they allow the uh, country companies uh, to set up a target and uh, have a policy going forward as well. So I think that's some of the area that maybe the institutional investors needs to work on uh, in Japan. We have several other questions. So this is a question to come to us. So this is the last question that we received in the chat box. The changes of the Articles of Incorporation, the resolution for that change, currently it's limited to that. So I think should we change the company law, company act? So the question, and the question, I have not been able to answer that question yet. Based on the current company's act, why shareholders have to make a proposal to change the articles of incorporation? The interpretation of the company's act is that what can be voted in the shareholders' meeting can only be the ones that shareholders can propose. So their proposals are limited, whatever that can be uh, resolved in the shareholders' meetings. So there's a limitation. For example, the changes or election of directors, changes of the articles of incorporations and resolution on how the profit is distributed or divided. So there is a limitation that is clearly indicated in the company's act. So if you want to make a proposal to a company in the shareholders meeting, all they can do is to make a resolution within this range. So ESG shareholders will look at the company's act. What tool should they choose? And the only tool that they can uh, utilize is the, the proposal to change the articles of incorporations. Why did I talk about the advisory resolutions? According to the company's act, this is not indicated as one that can be resolved in the shareholders' meetings, but if the company is willing to propose this resolution when they want to defend against a hostile takeover, a company 
he will actually present this advisory resolution in the shareholders meeting and ask for the, the perspectives of the shareholders. So this is a means to defend themselves from the hostile takeover. So if the company makes a decision, willing the propose the resolution, a new resolution in the shareholders meeting, this is not prohibited by the Companies Act. So it's up to the company's decision. But if you present the advisory resolutions, if the management of the company accept that, that can be voted in the shareholders meeting. As I mentioned earlier, it's up to the intention of the management. So there is uncertainty. But if you have sufficient support, the management would not be able to say no. So th there are dividing opinions whether that is a good idea to use advisory resolutions or not. There is also a discussion as to whether we can possibly amend the Companies Act. As a matter of fact, this discussion has not taken place in depth. Advisory resolution. If shareholders can actually file this resolution, I think this is a possibility for the company, the management. This is a concern because anything can be proposed to a shareholders meeting. If you look at the history of different companies, various groups of shareholders, in the form of amending the Articles of Incorporation, presented so many different resolutions. I can't give you the details at this point in time, but there have been many different proposals made by multiple shareholders. Some actually include whatever that should not be discussed in the shareholders' meetings. They have been precedent in the past. So the Japanese government, who has created this Companies Act, and also the researchers of the Japanese Companies Act, are not for changing the Companies Act. So that is the dominant opinion at this point in time. So the possibility of changing the Companies Act is quite slim. But for one thing, though, if we are going to find a breakthrough, there is a way. Sorry that I am speaking for a long time. Under the Japanese Companies Act, that can be resolved in the shareholders' meeting. It's according to the Companies Act as well as the whatever that is decided in the Articles of Incorporation. If each company has a set of advisory resolutions to be discussed and resolved in the shareholders' meeting, if they allow advisory resolutions in the Articles of Incorporations, so it will be a certain range of topics. Uh, if the at least the majority of the board of directors meeting accept to file this resolution in the shareholders meeting, it's possible. So it is possible if I. Um, the advisor to ESG shareholders, what I would do is to try to set exceptions in the Articles of Incorporation. 
make sure some of the advisory resolutions are to be filed and discussed in the shareholders' meeting. For example, climate-related advisory resolution should be presented to the shareholders' meeting as an exception. If all the external directors support this, at least if there is a condition this is met, the companies will have to actually present this resolution. This is not me saying outside Japan there are cases where shareholders utilizing this method to change the articles of incorporation. There has been an example done by overseas NGO. So there is a possibility. As I said earlier, however, you have to have two-thirds supporting the change of the articles of incorporation. That will be a hurdle. For other resolutions, it only requires a half of the directors supporting. So once again, many Japanese uh, institutional investors are not supporting the, the proposal to change the Articles of Incorporation. But ESG shareholders will uh, find this just one way to make a breakthrough. Thank you, Mr. Karamoto. So the time is up, so we'd like to close the Q&A session. Uh, we were unable to pick up one or two questions that were left, and we apologize for that. Okay. Uh, we have the post-event survey that we would like you to fill in. We will send you the link of the survey in the chat box. It's going to take less than five minutes, so it would be great if you can send in your comments and feedback on the seminar. And we will be holding different webinars on climate change and ESG issues, so it would be great if you can continue to attend. And thus, you responded to the survey. We will share the slides that we used in this webinar to the extent possible. So we hope to have your cooperation on this. Okay, as a wrap up of the event, we have some closing remarks. Thanks, Ko. Yes, sorry. Um, Look, I'm, I'm looking for you. Sorry. Yes, there you go. Yes, so it's time to close the event. So it's all it's it's all yours, Rebecca. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Rebecca, uh, head of publications at Insightia. Um, for those that don't know us, we are a reporting and proxy voting database firm. Um, it's been great working with Proxy Watcher and all of our many talented speakers on this event. Um, I'll be nice and speedy. But before we bring the event to a close, I just wanted to share one or two closing remarks, um, just reflecting more on the insights that have been shared during this webinar, webinar by all our talented speakers. Um, it's quite clear from the past hour and a half that ESG is becoming such an integral part of shareholder activism in Japan. And it seems very likely that companies will face more requests for enhanced sustainability reporting in the coming season. Um, and looking at our own proxy voting database that analyzes shareholder voting and activism trends, um, shareholder proposals are actually starting, you know, to only become a lot more popular in Japan. Um, we reported 12 environmental shareholder proposals that were subject to a vote throughout 2022 in Japan, which was actually quadruple the numbers seen in 2021. And average support for these increased all the way up to 17% compared to 14% a year prior. Um, and it's the same in regards to ESG activism, 
wherein shareholders might be looking for board representation or significant changes to a company related to topics like M&A. Um, according to our activism data module, which tracks shareholder activism campaigns and demands, eight environmental demands have been made at Japanese public companies in 2022, compared to just five a year prior. Um, so clearly, you know, there's some great stats there, and it's evident that Japan really is becoming a significant player in the ESG realm. Um, I also wanted to very briefly take this opportunity to highlight some of our Insightia newsletters that our attendees might find useful. Thanks, Kerry. Um, as you can all see here, we've got a QR code. Um, anyone who is interested in scanning this is, will be given access to a free trial of all the Insightia newsletters. Um, and these could prove to be very valuable for those looking to get a better understanding or regular updates related to the world of ESG and shareholder activism, whether in Asia or globally. Um, as you can see, we have three newsletters that we promote. Um, and some of these, like the Tuesday and Friday ones, they are roundups of some of the biggest news stories in shareholder activism. Um, well, activism and voting this week is one of our columns where we discuss ESG trends in more detail. Um, so please do feel welcome to sign up to these. Hopefully people find them very valuable. And please do reach out if you need any more information. But I think that brings our webinar to a close. So thank you so much, everyone, all the speakers and participants for chatting with us today. Um, and thank you, everyone, for sending through your great questions. We hope to see you at the next event. With that, we would like to conclude today's webinar. Looking forward to seeing you all in the next event. If you have additional questions, please send those questions to our email address. Once again, I'd like to show you the slide of newsletters. Once again, thank you very much for your participation today. Looking forward to seeing you all again. Thank you.